Back to school season is here and summer is still going strong. Visit Wetco to protect your car's paint from bugs and damage caused by UV rays. Ceramic wax keeps it shiny. If you're a teacher, student, or school staff, we'll give you 50% off a car wash between now and September 11th. Just show your school ID in store or sign up for unlimited washes and cram in all the washes you want for one monthly price starting at $14.99 per month. Go back to school at your brightest. Visit getgocafe.com slash unlimited today. In the Smoky Mountains, it's not just about getting away. It's about getting together to zoom across a zip line, splash down at water parks, shop till you drop, and say hello to the statue of our hometown hero, Dolly Parton. This year, discover the thrill of visiting the Smokies and reconnect with those you love the most in Sevierville, Tennessee. Learn more. Visit Sevierville.com. That's visit S-E-V-I-E-R-B-I-L-L-E dot com. So I took her down to the beach, like, oh, let's walk around. And, and we walked 100 feet under the beach. And right then I turned her at the whole affair had flipped around on her and is hanging up, upside down under her belly. And I'm looking at her thinking she's going to freak out, you know, and she's just looking at me like, what are you doing? Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason Gravely. Today's episode, I'm pretty excited about. You know, we've featured a lot of people who have gone across the the U.S., coast to coast across the U.S. in different mediums. I think we've had someone walking, tons of people biking. You know, people, of course, have driven, drive across the coast all the time. Uh, We've had all kinds of uh, uh, different mediums. We've had skateboarding, rollerblading, you know, touring, that is. I I just love the the aspect of of doing a journey across America, across, you know, coast coast to coast. Um, There's something so definitive about that, something so uh, complete about that, whether that's the coast of, you know, going, going across the continent of Africa or Australia has a really good coast to coast experience. Canada, of course. Um, South America, you can, but the, you know, going across the U.S., it's so for us here in the states, it's 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 an amazing experience because it, it, the the land is so different, and it's so vast, it changes so much. Um, there's so many different phases of a, a coast to coast trip in the U.S. that I, I just love people, you know, talking to people who have done that experience through different mediums. But today, something new. We're talking to someone who has taken a horse from coast to coast, literally rode a horse something that I think would be even harder to do than a lot of other mediums. But but Jesse here has not only ridden a horse across the U.S., it started taking a moped, then he did a bicycle. He's taken, he's literally flown his own airplane, a very small airplane across the U.S., and he saw a horse on his trip. He's going to tell the story. I'll let him tell the story. But he saw a horse on the cycling trip and thought, that's my next medium to take across the U.S. My next journey will be on horse. Uh, but anyway, I, w- I want to get into his story. There's so much we didn't get to, so, so much we didn't get to. But he has a book coming out this Thursday, August 5th, on the hoofbook.com. The, the, the book is called On the Hoof, and it just talks about this experience, what they went through. His horse's name is Pepper. Uh, it just seems like something I can't wait to get my hands on and start reading because uh, you never know. Maybe I, I'd love to try to do this one day. Uh, but before we jump in, I did want to give a huge shout out to uh, Expedia, the show sponsor today, and a podcast that they produce called Out Travel the System. When it comes to doing an adventure, it often requires traveling somewhere first, not always, but and so Out Travel the System is is basically a show to help inspire you and and inform you about travel, which means you know it can be anything from interviewing someone who's traveling to every country in the world and how they're doing it, very practical stuff, but also get inspiration from the people of the places that you want to go, interviewing folks that are at the destinations that live there and, and what it's like for people to come in and, and travel to their destination that they call home. 
They talk to airline pilots. They talk to people who travel year round, to people who make the most of their two weeks off every year. So it really is a show that is all about inspiring you to continue getting out there and having fun. So if you're going on an adventure and you got to travel, um, don't neglect that side of, of planning, that side of what it takes to get there. A lot of times that's the hardest part is just getting there. So if you need a little motivation in that area, definitely check out Out Travel the System. Like and subscribe and you can get the latest episode. All right, let's get into this episode. Um, but we're we're happy to introduce you to the show, Jesse Alexander McNeil, also known as Alex Alex Alexander McNeil. You might have met him as that out on the road. But Jesse, why don't you tell us about that uh that, what we were just talking about, that name distinction. And and of course, welcome to the show. Yeah, hey, thanks a lot, Mason. Really appreciate being here and uh all your podcasts are really quite interesting and I appreciate uh joining. Um so yeah, so kind of like traveling uh when you when you get out out on the road or into the woods uh some people adopt trail names as they go along um if they're on the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail and that kind of becomes their identity and um for me I still wanted to kind of keep my my own existence but Alex is my middle name and so I started going by Alex while I was on on the horseback ride as sort of a way of kind of pushing the envelope a, a little bit on my, on my, uh, travel, on my character. And I mean, on my personality and, and how I felt, um, I wanted to kind of go into the world and, uh, kind of shed some of the old past a little bit. And so sometimes you go by your first name, you're always associated with what you did before and not where you're going to next. So that, that was my own little attempt to kind of like, kind of go a little further for myself. I've never heard of anyone doing that with their actual names, but I love that concept because you you do, anyone that hasn't done an adventure, maybe you listen to this show as like a way to explore what it, this would be like, but I think that's a big reason trail names exist is just you feel like such a different person out there. Like I, me personally, I feel like my my like primitive instinctual, and, and and very you know tuned in version of me comes out and it, and it, and, it, and it, then it gets put away and I zip up my civilized self when I get back to quote normal life. I've never thought about doing something like that, but that would be. I think that should be a thing. Your what's your adventure name? Not just your trail name, but what's your adventure <laughs> right. name? Right, right, totally. Could be because yeah, it's no, with it's... you too. You know what I mean? It, it's yeah, not and, you know something and random that no one would call you some people might call you alex or at least they know that's your middle name right right and it's on your driver's license in case you get into trouble you know? there you go <laughs> your, your parents you know will, will call you by your middle name or at least say it when you're you know doing something wrong tell us about where you grew up and what you grew up doing and, and how you started getting into these things um, i'm always interested to know was it something you discovered on your own or were you encouraged to do it as a kid? Well, I, uh, I grew up in the country, so that definitely helps, I think, uh, for somebody getting out there into the mountains and into the forest, if they kind of come from that environment a little bit. Um, but I grew up in, uh, in the countryside in, in New Hampshire and a small town of 2000. Um, and from there, I was definitely always in the outdoors, kind of running around as a kid. And then that in, in high school, I got into backpacking and rock climbing and, and just kept pushing the envelope on that. And into into whitewater canoeing and into whitewater kayaking and rafting and going into, into my 20s and guiding trips. Um, and then more into rock climbing, went abroad, climbed down in Australia and New Zealand for a year on uh, on, on rock climbing trips and all, all across the U S and so, um, but I was always doing all, all these journeys by car, right? Most people would go by car on a big road trip. And as, as I was, um, wanting to travel further or kind of more into the zone, I tried, uh, I started to take on, take different modes of, of transportation than just regular road trips. Um, and that's kind of how it started to, and where all these unique ways of travel happened. And then it ultimately turned into this, into this book I wrote about traveling by horse. 
Well, you you mentioned, uh, you know, it went from cars to wanting to do things via uh, other means. What what was it for you? Did you start doing backpack trips, or was it was it on bicycle? How did you pare down and then build back up to to horses or a horse? Well, I think uh, I'm trying to think here. So, I think the the first long distance trip I did was I was finishing up uh, college, and then yeah. That's what it was. A couple of weeks after college, um, after I graduated, I went went down to uh, Springer Mountain in Georgia, like like so many other people have, and uh, started walking to Maine on the Appalachian Trail. Oh yeah. And uh, left on that trip uh, about a week after graduation, and uh, that made a lot of sense to me because I grew up in New Hampshire and I'd been on the Appalachian Trail up in the White Mountains a lot. Um, and so I knew that area, but I hadn't, hadn't done hiking down in the South before. So, um, it just, that was a perfect, that was a perfect starting, you know, to, to traveling long distance, you know, graduating college and just being done, being done with all of like the book work and, and jobs and, and just getting out for a little bit and, uh, definitely had to do it on a, on a, on a shoestring, you know, I didn't, didn't have a trust fund or anything. And so I, earned a lot of uh, money delivering pizzas prior to that <laughs> to, to, to get out on oh, the trail yeah. for, oh, yeah. for five, six months. So, um, so, so yeah, that's where it started. I think it started with, with like long distance backpacking on the Appalachian trail. Um, and that was from doing other, you know, uh, multi-day and, and, and week long backpacking trips um, during, you know, teenagers and, and college too. Man, I, I tell you what, that's so relatable. So many of the same things uh, I would do. Scrubbing toilets before graduating college to to take my gap year after graduation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, gap, year, gap years are great. I, I did a couple gap years. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, oh, that's too funny. I did, I did many, many gap years in a row. Um, that's, I love that. So, well, tell us about, you know, when, when you were on an adventure, um, at some point you got the idea to, to do an adventure by, by horseback or, you know, on, on, on a horse. Tell us about, you know, what did you experience or what did you see or what started planting that seed for you? Cause, uh, that's a little bit unusual, I guess you could say in today's adventure realm yeah yeah totally i um well after after uh the appalachian trail um i was out west on on multiple rock climbing trips going out west and uh ended up settling on one of them trips up in the san juan islands north of seattle so i had a great time out there the the islands are super beautiful great for hiking and sailing and kayaking and I did a trip from there to go back to my home state in New Hampshire um, to see my mom, actually, because she was still living at work at, at the house I grew up in. And so I hopped on a just for kicks. And I, again, I didn't have a lot of money. So money seems to be the kind of like what like leads your leads your experience. And so I um, I bought a, a little moped and I just started mopeding back to New Hampshire uh, cause I just thought that would be kind of fun and novel and, uh, it didn't cost that much in gas either. Pretty, pretty and, fuel efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I think I spent about $52 in gas <laughs> to go, crazy. to go, to go from, from, uh, the Pacific ocean to the Atlantic ocean. What, what was that like? I mean, that's an adventure. You're not going very fast. are you? <laughs> no, it was slow. It was like, I think. I was going about 22 miles an hour and then I got kind of sick of how slow I was going and I was getting up into the mountains and I stopped in Montana and I found this moped shop that did like retrofits and so I was able to get a bigger exhaust on, on the on the moped so that allowed me to go like 26 miles an hour. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, over the course of the country, that'll that'll make a few days difference. I'm oh sure. yeah, I was like flying at that point. <laughs> hold uh, on, hold on, we're going to one. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was really flashy exhaust on this like little junky moped. <laughs> it didn't, made no sense, you know. What'd your What'd your mother think? You pull up to the house in that thing? Oh, she was like just like, well, I think 
I think she was really concerned because I was always next to the side of the road, you know, and like, you can be okay. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. I got lights on, you know, because I was wearing a backpack and I had a, a gas tank strapped to the back. And then I had a little, uh, like crazy Creek wrapped around the, the, the moped gas tank, you know, just, I mean, I, I brought with me as much as I could, you know, but still it wasn't a great deal. And so it, it all kind of worked. I felt a little kind of protected in some ways if something did go sideways. So like the moped. Yeah, it, it was, it was a pretty, pretty desperate, uh, attempt to be easy rider. <laughs> I just, this poor moped was like, I wasn't, I wasn't built for this. <laughs> please, no. Please help. No. Oh my gosh. That sounds like a, a few adventure sports podcast episodes right there. That yeah. adventure. So, yeah. so at some point you wanted to go even slower, I presume. So, yeah. So then after that, well, after that, I ended up getting a, I ended up moving back to New, to New Hampshire for a couple of years and started building a house and just kind of went down that road for a bit. But then I was going to go back out West and I bought a motorcycle and I went back out West on a motorcycle. And so, and so that was, that was, no, is that how, it, well, somewhere in there it is. So I went back on a motorcycle um, and then I'm back on the West coast and I, oh, and then I ended up selling the land I had back in New Hampshire and kind of cashed out on that. And I was able to get my pilot's license. So I bought a little airplane, learned how to fly it. And then I flew that back to New Hampshire. And um, ironically with that trip, that was like, took as long as the moped because there was so much weather in the way. And I always had to land because of clouds. And that was like way more expensive, like same, same length of time, but it cost me like $1,500 in gas. <laughs> so it's just like, I could have taken the moped, you know, for the way cheaper in the same amount of time, but it was really fun. It was, it was, a, it was just, I mean, you got to be aware and, and, uh, you know, you're going over the mountains and a little hundred horsepower airplane. So you got to leave early and make sure the weather's clear and know how high the mountains are. And so I learned a lot on that one for sure. So, wow. and I actually picked up a friend. So I convinced one, one uh, the, a friend of mine who I actually met on the Appalachian trail that I, who was living in Boise at the time. I said, Hey, Arizona, Jeff, you should like fly to Seattle and then I'll pick you up and then I'll deliver you back to Boise. And he's like, well, well, what are we doing? And so I'm, I can't tell you that, but get to Seattle and I'll pick you up and we'll fly back to, Bo- or we'll get back to Boise. So I pick him up in the airplane and he's just like, what the hell? Like, where'd you get this? And I'm like, Oh, I just started learning how to fly. And, and so we like got all kind of situated and spent a couple of days in the San Juans. And then we started flying back to flying to Boise. And the reason I wanted him to come along was that I wanted somebody to read the maps as we're going over the mountains. And so, but he, the charts are a little different than like regular, like, you know, like maps you'd have for backpacking. And so he's looking at the, at the charts. He's like, I don't really understand all this. I'm just like pointing to, to him to book, like, just read me that number, read me this number. And, and at one point we're starting to go up over the mountains and I look, look at, and I'm like, man, this is crazy, Jeff. He's like, what's so crazy? He's like, I've, I'm like, I've never been this high in an airplane before. <laughs> <laughs> and we were at like 4,000 feet. I just never, we had, all my during practice training was always 2,000 feet, you know? So I'm like, I've never been this high in an airplane before. And uh, he's just like, God, I wish you didn't tell me this stuff right. as we're doing it, you know? <laughs> You're flying through the air on the, the moped of airplanes. Yeah, and exactly. That's exactly. That's, yeah, it yeah. can be a scary place to be. That's exactly. Yeah. Oh, so, man. over the Rocky Mountains. Good gracious. Over, over the Cascades. Over, over the, the Cascades. Cascades. Oh, yeah. geez, even more well, to, jagged. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. To Boise, and then from there it was over the Rockies into Montana. What a beautiful view! So, views, I'm sure, over the Cascades in particular. Good gracious. Yeah. Um, very pretty. Oh my gosh, that is that is wild. So. So at some point you you met Pepper, uh, your horse. T- tell us what where did that? I mean, you're you've got this fascination with taking 
different mediums across the country back to New Hampshire to see your mom, apparently. And uh, a horse was, you know, is this going to be one of, of, of more or is this kind of where it was all leading to was was a horse on the horse? I think it was all like ultimately le- uh, leading to it because once I was on the horse trip, it, like it, that made sense to me. Like that just brought it all home. It was very, very basic and like like traditional and uh so so how that came about was i ended up then flying back to the west coast later on like a year later i then then so how i got into the horse trip was i then like a a year after that i got a bicycle and i wanted to so then i started bicycling across canada and um so i was bicycling across canada and that's when i met a horse on the trip that made me think about getting a horse to take riding. And I had this one moment that really like set the tone and I was bicycling across uh, Saskatchewan and it was like really windy out, big headwind and it's just desolate prairie everywhere. And I kept bicycling on this quiet road into this headwind and I came alongside this ranch and off to the right, there was this one horse that was in a field and he was, and, and his mane was getting all blown back and his tail's going up. And he was like leaning against the fence and he wanted to like, he was watching me like dead eyes watching every, as I'm inching my way in, into the headwind. And I looked back at him and I was like, that's, I'm like, that's it. I need to be on a horse, you know, like that's going to be way more interesting than being on this bicycle. So I kept bicycling and bicycling and went, kept going across Canada and around Maine and into the Bay of Fundy and bicycling down the, the, the main coast and, to New Hampshire and what got home to, to family homestead. And, and, but the whole time I'm thinking about this horse that I met, that I saw in Saskatchewan. And so when I end up going back to, back to the West coast, I then started organizing for a horse trip. That's amazing. You know, it's, it's, you knew right then that you, you were a horse person. For this experience, well, I just, at least. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. I, mean, I was just so curious. <laughs> I was like, I don't know anything about horses, you know? It's like, but that, like, that's what to do, you know? If you're going across, like, the country, you should want to go on a horse. You want a horse. And, and I guess you learn how as you go. You learn some basics, but you really learn a lot as you go. Well, tell us, tell us what was the idea and what were you starting out to do? Well, I don't like to, like, plan trips too much. And so I knew I needed to get a horse that was, but I could go that far in planning. And so I had to at least get a horse. And so, so I went up to Alaska and I was commercial fishing for the summer to come up with enough money for the, to go buy a horse. And so I came back and I started researching where I went, I was at the time I was living in Montana. So I went back to Montana. I figured that'd be a good place to, to get a horse. And so I took a couple books out of the Bozeman library and, and uh, on basically like how to ride a horse. And so I was just like, okay, this is it. Just how to. And then I started going around uh, Bozeman and the outer other towns like checking out horses that were for sale. And so I thought it'd be kind of like buying a car, you know, like you just kind of go and check out the horse and like kick the tires, you know, and, and yes. then see what you think. But I realized first time I turned up at, at this, at this ranch to go check out this horse that I knew nothing about horses. And so he's like, well, what do you think? You know, and he like brings the horse out and I'm like looking at it and I'm like, well, how old is he? You know, I'm like thinking about age, you know, like how old's a car, you know, and I'm like, and I, then I'm like wanting to kind of pick up the horse's feet to look at the, you know, to look at the hooves. And right. but yet I didn't know, I didn't know how to do it, you know, and now I've learned you basically lean into the horse, you get the horse to go off balance and then you, then you, then you snatch a hoof and bring it up, you know, and do it with like authority and, and, and the horse will, will yield to that. But at the time I didn't. And so I would just kind of like look at the ho- hooves on the ground. I'm like, oh, those look, look, look like good hooves. Yeah. <laughs> but Plenty I, of miles I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I end up like not, so I looked at all these different horses and different breeds and I dialed in on a Tennessee Walker. And the reason I, I dialed on, came in on that, on that particular breed was because there's, there's two kinds of horses there's gated horses and non-gated horses and a non-gated horse is like a quarter horse or saddlebred and it's it's basically 
a horse that just that will have a normal four beat gallop to it. Well, I'm not sure if I have all all this correct. It's been a little bit since I read, read about it, but a gated horse, when it when it goes into a trot, it will be a more even keeled trot. It's not a big up and down jolting experience, which you would have to post by going up and down in the saddle. That's another skill that you have to learn or ride the horse is you got to post up and down at the same time in in timing with the horse. And since I didn't know much about riding at all, I didn't grow up riding or anything. So I thought, well, if I get this other kind of horse, this gated horse, a Tennessee walker, I don't have to learn how to post. And it should be like a little more of a comfortable ride. And um, so that, so then I started looking at Tennessee walkers. And after about the third one, I found Pepper. And I was like, this is it. You know, she didn't know much either. She's a young horse. And I was like, well, this is kind of good, you know. I can be the first owner and we can like learn together. There you go. You, you, you know, an airplane probably seems like the, the most preparation because you got to get a license and all that. And, and there's a lot to know there, but a horse seems right up there as far as complexity of understanding what you're doing, just because you're, you're dealing with another living creature. It's not just a machine that's complicated. It's a, it's a, it's a being. And that takes I'm sure some totally different dynamics, especially compared to something like the bicycle or even the moped. What what was it like? What did you have to do with, with Pepper as far as understanding and, and what were maybe some of the first few weeks out on the road like? Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that helped make this show possible. For the ones standing guard, for the eagle-eyed, for the knights in shining armor, and for all those who support them, we are Granger, your experienced safety partner, offering supplies and solutions for every industry, committed to helping keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com slash safety or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. At Speedway, no thirst goes unquenched, and that includes yours. Right now, any size speedy freeze or fountain drink is only 99 cents. Find your nearest Speedway at speedway.com slash locations. Speedway. Summer happens here. Excludes maximum speedy freeze or fountain drink. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Well, I came to realize that I was basically always learning. Like, it, it wasn't like, oh, well, let's get kind of trained up here over a couple of weeks or, or you know, a month or so, and then we'll be all set. I was constantly learning. And so I ended up uh, getting Pepper in December and I trained with her till Mar mid-March. So we did about three months of training and I would go out to the stable that I, that I, kept, that I kept her at and I'd go out there every day, regardless of what kind of snow or wind was going on. This is up in Montana. So sometimes we had big blizzards going on, but I'd still go out and just, you know, I just figured if we're going to do this out, out traveling, we might as well get started here. And it was, it was, I think we were still, we were kind of nervous of each other the whole time at the beginning, you know, we didn't really know, know each other well enough. And so it was very tentative, you know, we'd kind of test each other, but we were kind of kept this respectful, like arms length distance about how to interact. And um, she would definitely like, let me put a saddle on her and, and pick up her feet. But even then I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I'm still new at it, you know? <clears throat> and uh, so I would just do a little thing, like one thing at a time, you know, like I'd have like, okay, today's, today's lesson is just like going into a, into a arena with her and try to like ride her around the arena 10 times you know, in some sort of controlled fashion and not fall off, you know, I mean, that's how basic it was like, and, and if that, if that happened, then it was like, great, we're, we're good. We're done for the day. Um, I always tried to end on a positive note. I definitely treated Pepper like a dog. Like I treated it like, like this is dog training because that's what I had, had played around with dog training when I was a kid in 4-H and I think, well, the, and that was my only like like connection to like some large animal that I would have to try to control. And so I think the more I did that, it, it actually worked out pretty good, you know, 
by um, because then you're not so nervous and and because horses pick up on 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 people's sensitivities so quickly you know they'll take advantage of the situation quite quite fast if if they know that somebody's nervous or is backing up or is threatening and they'll back off and so you're not getting the like an authentic like connection when either they feel like they need to take control or they feel like they have to hide they they have to defend themselves and so um kind of being at being at one with the animal it was really key but it took a lot of practice because you know to be around a thousand pound animal when you've never done that you got to be got to build up that confidence yourself what were some of the logistics of, of making this happen initially? What I mean, are you just walking on the side of the road? Are you sticking to, you know, smaller roads or dirt roads? Or, or how are you navigating across the country on a, on a through a system of roads that aren't built for horses? Yeah, it's definitely, it would have been way easier 100 years ago, right? <laughs> a, lot, a, lot less, a lot less roads and fences out there. Well, probably just as many fences, but a lot less roads. Um, I pretty much just set a compass bearing, and I just shot it shot east. I I literally just went east, and it, if it was over the mountains, it was over the mountains. If it was through the desert, it was through the desert. If it was alongside a highway that, like, you know, I could feel like I, we could handle to be on, you know, or uh, then it was a, alongside a highway. So it, people's backyards. I mean, it was literally like just you just shot a compass line and so i left from um southern oregon coast in brookings oregon which is about a mile north of the california border um and i left from there because i wanted to go just a little further south um than leaving up say around bellingham washington i was leaving in mid-march and i knew in mid-march at that time you'd, you'd still be dealing with a lot of snow um, so by leaving a little further south was going to be better weather for departing less snow. And, um, it was also, I knew, so, so that was the plan there. And I, I figured it'd be kind of a straighter shot because then it would be coming just below the Great Lakes. So I'd go just south of Chicago and then turn at an angle up to New Hampshire at that point. Um, so I, that was an actually an interesting point when I eventually did turn away from going due east. So I would spend many months going due east, and then all of a sudden my compass bearing shifted, and that was like kind of a big moment. Um, but yeah, that's how I planned it. I, I, I photocopied um, Gazetteer Atlas map, maps and uh, laminated them and bundled them up into two or three states at a time and had um, a couple people send them to me along the way. And so I would just look at the maps and shoot a compass bearing and that was it. Uh, I did have a GPS as like an emergency backup and also to record distance. Um, I, I was really trying to be careful to not put too much mileage in each day, like um, unknowingly, because it, it, it's easy to keep going with the miles because horses don't tell you that they're done. They'll just keep riding and riding and riding and they'll, wow. and so you gotta like, you gotta, you, you need breaks. And, and that was a lesson that uh, took me a couple of times to, to learn was, uh, was when to stop. Because I'm my, looking at this route yeah. that you went, you know, just over the California, Oregon line, just right there. There is not a lot out there. Just when you look at the map and all the way over to Idaho, then you're crossing Wyoming in parts of Nebraska and Iowa, what mm-hmm. what were you experiencing? What was some of the the challenges or some of the things you were seeing? That's that's a lot of terrain. Like that's an epic yeah. series of, <laughs> of, of of mountain ranges and deserts even to get through. Um, that's that's legendary terrain out there for for some very well known or you know expeditions. Yeah, yeah, it was it was actually in a lot of ways I did the hard part first. Which, which which made it even harder um, because we hadn't we hadn't learned to get along yet we hadn't got a schedule t- dialed in yet we hadn't got strong enough yet and so we left from the Pacific Ocean and immediately went right into the mountains we went up into um, the Sis- uh, Siskiyou Coastal Range 
And immediately we're like crossing rivers and streams and going up ridges and down ridges. And the first five, six days, I think I covered only like 30 miles in like six days, the first, Jeez. the first chunk. And it was just, I mean, there was one day, I think I was, we did a quarter mile in an hour or two, maybe two hours. It just like, it was so thick with like brush and finding our way through and super steep. And then there was burned out forest to deal with and which makes the ground really like, like, uh, like hazard filled with pepper post holding through because of like broken down stumps that were burned out. And so and there's nobody there. <laughs> there's no roads there. There's, there's nothing wow. there. And so, so right, we just jumped into the fire right at the very beginning. And that was a little bit unknowingly because I was initially going to be going a little further north uh, uh, up the coast and then in. But we had such a long drive from Montana with with the horse trailer that ended up being a really slow drive. And so in the evening, I ended up getting let off at a different spot that, that I chose about 30 miles before I was initially going to kind of be dr dropped off. And I was like, and I told the driver, I'm like, Hey, let's just stop here. This is crazy. It's like 1030 at night. Let's just stop here. I can get into the mountains from, from this, this river right here. It's called the uh, wind truck river range. And I was like, I can get in from here. And so he dropped me off and he's all right, have a good day. And there, there we are like the horse and me and the, a pile of gear side the road at you know 10 30 at night and um just wondering okay what did i get you know here we go this is it and so i dragged all the stuff down down to like a wooded beach area and made camp down there and started sorting through all the gear and started to pack pepper up and uh, i did not actually even packed her for the first time yet you know how you like pack your backpack before you go, oh, yeah. you go, yeah. you go up. Well, I never, I'd done so much backpacking that I kind of treated that part like it wasn't necessary. And so when I eventually packed Pepper's saddlebags all up, it was just this catastrophe of a arrangement that I had going on with her and so, <laughs> ropes were all tied in different directions. And I was like, okay, I think everything is on, you know, like, like, you know it was a pretty pretty funny affair and so i took her down to the beach like well, let's walk around and and we walked 100 feet under the beach and right then i turned around the rope went tight and i turned around and the whole affair had flipped around on her and is hanging up, upside down under her belly and i was just like holy moly like and i'm looking at her thinking think she's gonna freak out you know and she's just looking at me like what are you doing <laughs> and right. so I did take the whole thing apart and drag it all back to the to the camp again and drag her take her back and repack again and so it took about actually a day and a half to get that sorted out and felt right you know that it was going to be in a controlled way that we we're going up into the mountains and not like total yard sealing our ourselves up there so um but yeah that was the beginning that was that was the beginning of the trip the first the first week so what, was there anything you came across early on that felt either impassable or a, an obstacle that that really really challenged really challenged you? I know the whole thing is a challenge, big obstacle, honestly, but anything in particular? Well, I think actually it was. It was about the fourth day in that there was a river crossing um, that. I had gone up the river and down the river and I'm looking at other places to go. And I realized like the only way to keep going East is to forge across this river. And, uh, and I'm looking at the river and I've from, from my kayak and raft guide days, I'm like, okay, I figure I can go in through here and across here, but it's like, how am I going to bring a horse? You know, how is this going to work? And, and the water didn't look that deep, but it was fast and, and it's out in the wilderness. And so if something goes wrong, it's like nobody to save you or even know where you are, you know, um, cause I, I didn't have a spot or any of the GPS, um, little equipment with, with me. I never used that. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first thing. So when I made that commitment to cross this river, it was like, I'm going to keep going because I don't, to come back was even more hazardous. And, uh, so I ended up stripping down and I had one rope, one end of the rope tied to pepper and 
I had the other end. I'm holding onto the to the other end, and I just jumped in, and started swimming across, and I got over t- to the shallow spot after going getting pushed downstream a bit, and. Pepper's looking at me and I give her a tug and she starts walking across and I was like, okay, this is it. We're committed now. And, um, you know, put my clothes back on and we started going up, up the next mountain range because I was like, we're, we're in it now. There's no turning back now. Um, so, and, and at that point that was really awesome because that like, like showed a bonding between horse and I, you know, Pepper and I seemed to really kind of get each other at that point, you know, because she was going to be like my lifeline in case something went wrong, you know, because a rope was attached to her. Wow. Uh, and man, what a, what an experience y'all, y'all had been through it at that point, or at least, you know, forming those very strong ties early on. Um, Cause I'm sure you, you'd need it every day. Was there any concern, or, or or tell me about this? Actually, let, let, I want to ask about this. What what was it like to to camp with Pepper? What was the process there, and um, how, was it just pretty simple, or something that was challenging compared to doing trips on your own? Uh, it was at first. I thought that was going to be fairly easy, but um, horses have a you know unlimited need for food, and so they'll. Yeah, so well, I would, what did you do about that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's exactly. At first, I thought I could just forage wherever, and Pepper would have enough food that way. But as, as I soon learned, as like after the first month, it's like, wow, we need to really supplement this with with more hay if I can get some when I come close to a town or into, or to a ranch. So I'd start like looking out for hay, and then later on. It's like, okay, we need to really sub- really start to add in more grain too. And so I started getting rid of my own stuff to pack more grain that so she could eat more. Um, and that ended up being a really crucial um, part of the of the journey too, was changing that up. Um, but in regards to packing uh, to camping with horses, um, basically, I always had to make sure wherever I tied her to that she wouldn't get wrapped around nearby trees um, or or, or sagebrush or fence posts. And uh, so I would always, so I had this 50 foot rope that I basically just tied her to just like a dog. <laughs> and I, she just, I just, and I knock it a uh, aluminum picket in the ground and uh, hopefully out in the field. And then she can just graze in the big circle and not get tied around anything. When we're in the woods, I'd have to, tie up the rope short to a tree and then keep moving her from tree to tree so that she can keep grazing on like the brush and the the grass that's around or even just in the middle of the night have to move her again sometimes she would find a way to get wrapped around a tree so i'd wake up a couple times a night and and have to go check on her um, uh, so in the end, it was definitely easier to be out in fields or ranch or go to ranches or people's backyards where it's open and grassy. And, uh, um, but that wasn't always the case. Um, in the desert, I basically looked for the largest sagebrush I could find. Um, and I would tire to that, um, because the roots on those are so much deeper than what, and then the aluminum picket that I would knock in the ground with a rock, which in like crackly dry ground would often pull, uh, it would be easy to pull out. So uh, the sagebrush was a key, but then you'd, she'd get twisted around other sagebrush. So I, sometimes I'd, I'd go riding around in the desert to try to find a spot that would wor- would work for us overnight. You know, that that's one thing when you're out West and you have that space, uh, what what were some of the challenges as you got closer to home with either, you know, I'm sure that was pretty lush, a little, maybe a little more greenery, but more congested too, especially around places like Chicago. Yo, yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely the further east you got, the more, the less public space and the more private property signs. But ironically, actually, one of the worst pro- private property areas that I deal with was in, in eastern Wyoming. Um, the way the the layout of fences were and people's property, it was, it was, I kept getting pushed onto highways around that area. And so that always made it pretty dodgy to be going along a highway with cars going by at 80 miles an hour. But the further east I got, it was, um, it was basically hard to find a spot that you weren't like 
getting called by the cops. <laughs> right. because there's a horse you, in my yard <laughs> yeah the horse in my yard or there's like a horse in the park and it's like you know I don't, and then the park ranger turn up and i'm like what a horse is not allowed here like well they are but they never come around so that's why the cops are called again sorry about this and you're gonna have to keep moving like we're not we're gonna keep it in calls by the locals about about you being here and uh, but then uh, so other people would come up and they'd be all excited and bring their kids and want to pet the horse. So you're constantly on on parade is what it felt like. I and was going to say, I'm sure you felt like just, a, yeah. just an anomaly across everything yeah. you went. To. Yeah. And so in the evenings, I'd, I'd, I'd actually try to find a spot to camp before town out in the fields out in some field, like a cornfield or something on the edge of a cornfield that might be close to a stream or a creek and just camp kind of stealth camp in the woods with the horse. And then in the morning I could ride into town, get coffee and get some grain for pepper or hay or something from the supply store or, or a nearby farm and then keep going. Because if I end up in town that night, I might find a place to camp with the horse, but it was, you know, off in the middle of the night, some cop cop car would come around and there'd be there'd be lights on my tent, you know, asking why there's a horse next to me. And so, and so, right. and so I'd be like, like, oh, I didn't see a sign that horses aren't allowed here. Like, well, uh, we just don't know what's going on here. So can I get your license and registration? I'm not driving a car. Like, right. like oh my gosh. But what what do you feel like the experience taught you as you started approaching the end what did you feel did you feel like you went out and, and achieved what you were trying to achieve in every aspect yeah i think i think i did it took me a long time though i i thought i'd have it dialed in in, in the first month or month and a half you know like from what i've learned in the past is that the first two weeks of like any new trip is always going to be the hardest so i figured after with this one like after the first month i'll get it kind of dialed in well, after a month, I, I'd, I'd actually, it took a whole month to go across Oregon and I'd done six, 600 miles across Oregon and I still wow. didn't feel like I knew what was going on. I felt like every day was desperate. I felt like, like Pepper was getting more and more tired. Uh, I was getting more and more anxious and not like, like short tempered. And I was like, man, this is gonna, this is hard. This is gonna, this is gonna take me a, a lot longer to figure out than I thought. And then I, after I did another 1,200 miles by horseback, and then I trained Pepper to a cart to pull me, so she'd be in a in a single horse uh, horse cart, like they call a sulky, and I would sit in the back. It looked like a bit like a ski chairlift with two wheels attached, and I drove her um, from Nebraska to Pennsylvania, and so that kind of like. So the whole thing, the whole trip took a whole new left turn with like learning a whole new way of doing things. So I felt like I was just constantly learning and forced to like, like how to, you know, deal with like taking Pepper down the side, you know, a busy road in a cart with tractor trailers going by that I couldn't see until they were coming up alongside me. And it's like, and everybody was in like where I could like, you know, stop her for, for the moment and try to get in between other cars. And, and it was just really, it was constantly like a constant test every day. was a test. Um, and I think I don't, then eventually I got her back into the saddle because it got too hilly in Pennsylvania. And we took a month off at that point because Pepper really needed a month to like, just be out in the field and like fatten up a bit because we, we were, we're working a lot of miles. And so it wasn't until I was probably in the middle of Pennsylvania that I started to get it, that I started to become more patient. And I understood that it wasn't just about me. It was about, it was about Pepper's happiness and how Pepper was going along and how we should get along. And, and just patience, patience was huge. And uh, then after a while, I didn't even feel like I needed to go to the ocean anymore. I didn't want to, I was like, there was no point to go to the to finish i could have i could just keep riding out and just take a left turn and go up to canada you know and just like it, it was nice it was the feeling of the destination wore away and uh, i just actually enjoyed being out there but it, it took a good three thousand miles to figure that out 
Hey, if you got if you got the time, and you got the ability to put in the miles. It's it's a great way to figure things out. Uh, to me, being out there on an adventure. Well, well, tell us what what folks could expect with reading the book. What they what can they expect to to learn from you and learn from the book and 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 where are they going to be able to find it? In you know, once once it comes out. Uh, yeah. So uh, the book book is called On the Hoof, Pacific to Atlantic, uh, a thirty eight hundred mile adventure. And it's uh, going to be available at, on Amazon, but it'll also be available in, in bookshelves. Uh, I mean, in bookstores all around. It's put out by a great press called uh, Trifle Group Square Press um, that have done uh, other equine-based books. But it's also kind of a good crossover read. It's not just about horseback riding. It's it's really an adventure book. So uh, it's it's traveling with a horse is is definitely the mode but it's not it's it's really adventure and uh soul seeking and kind of being uh comfortable in your own shoes and and uh not meeting your goals you know you you don't always meet your meet your goals and how to how to deal with that um and so yeah it'll be available in uh august 5th so august 5th it should be available on, on amazon and and anywhere else so definitely check it out. And you can also check out, um, I have a Facebook page called uh, On the Hoof. Also, jessemcneil.com shows links on there on, on how to buy the book directly or to the Facebook page. And I did a, I did a Facebook page uh, while I was on the journey. So there's a lot of photos on there and uh, people that I met along the way. And and one thing we didn't talk about, which was absolutely critical, was was the people that I met along the way. Um, if it wasn't for all the kind people and even the, the stern ones that were like, what are you doing? I, I, I wouldn't have learned as much um, because uh, it, you don't really ju- you don't travel alone. You know, it's you it don't. might be a solo solo journey, but you don't really travel alone. So I, I hate it for the people that don't know that if you're listening to this show and you, and you're, you know, have a negative perspective on the world and on on people. Put yourself out there in the middle of nowhere doing something. Adventure breaks down barriers. It really does, especially when you have a medium as cute as Pepper, where it's like, yeah. or, or or as approachable as Pepper, where it's like, oh my God, this guy's on a horse. I, I need to talk to him. I haven't seen someone oh. ride through our town on a horse ever. I've got to know oh, what's yeah. going on. <laughs> Totally. I went up, I went up into an old mining ghost town up in, uh, in Idaho and, and I rode up into this rundown mining town that had like a few people that would still live up there in the summer. And I'm, and I'm riding up on pepper and they're like, they all turn, turn around and look at me. They're having a barbecue and they're like, Oh my God, we haven't seen a horse ride into town in a long time. And it just kind of <laughs> set the whole new tone. And yeah, horses definitely become like quick ambassadors to, to, to bonding with, with strangers. Oh man. I love it. It's uh, that's adventure. You know, the bicycle will do the same thing. I guarantee you a moped will do it. And I promise you a small engine uh, plane will do the same thing too. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> no, no, uh, no hesitation there for folks wanting to come up to you. You're, you're the anomaly of their day. That's for sure. But uh, yeah. Yeah. And you are for them too, because sometimes they're the only person I saw for the whole day after exactly. riding through the desert, you know? And so it was like, as much as I enjoyed seeing me, I enjoyed seeing them. And it was even nicer when they had a, like a, a water spick nearby. <laughs> in some grass. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, well, Jesse, this has been absolutely fantastic. Is there anything else you want to share before we head out or, or is it, uh, just get, tell no. people to get the book. Yeah. Just go, go ahead and get the book. And, uh, we're definitely going to, keep putting more updates on on facebook and and on my uh website and so i'm sure there'll be other adventures to come and um there's a lot of wonderful people out there so the only the only way you'll you'll get to meet them is if you if you get out there oh that's awesome fantastic well thanks for joining the show and uh yeah we'll we'll uh we'll be in touch when it comes out cool thanks mason appreciate the time first of all Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. 
You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. If you've got an insurance question, you could talk to a park ranger, but the only quotes they'd probably give you would be about the beauty of a fallen leaf or ripples in a pond, not the kind that could save you money on your policies. Or you could talk to your local Geico agent, who's an expert navigator of the insurance landscape. They could use their expertise to guide you on ways to save hundreds on your policies, while leaving it up to your park ranger to save the wilderness and any endangered picnic baskets. Go online to geico.com local to find a Geico agent near you.